Okay, moving on, we're gonna get into limits now. And with limits, what we wanna do with limits is talk about what it actually means. A limit is just what the graph is doing in and around a point. As you get, you get closer and closer with the X coordinate, what Y value am I approaching? That's all it is. And some people tend to overwork this, but it's just what is the graph doing? That's all you have to do. Now, this is a little bit more of a formal definition. Most of us have had this in pre-calculus, at least as an introduction. And so the limit as x approaches c of f of x is going to be equal to l. The l is a y-coordinate. The c is the x-coordinate. As x approaches some value, f of x, the y-coordinates, will get to this l. That's all that means. So let's try some of these and see what happens. If I talk about this first one, the limit as x approaches negative 4. Now, I have to be driving to the same place from both sides in order for the limit to exist. Am I? Yes. The y-coordinate there is going to be 1. Left and right limits would be 1. What is the graph doing? Well, we're getting closer and closer to 1 as x gets closer and closer to negative 4. There you go. What about when we get x approaches negative 1? Well, when I do this, I talk just about the approaching. It doesn't matter what's there when I get there, but am I approaching from the left side the same y value as I am from the right side? And the answer in this case would be 4. four. Yes, I am. So this limit would be 4. Now, it doesn't matter that this point is defined down here. We just need to know that that limit where we're driving to is equal to 4. Okay, so if we keep on moving on here now with the next one, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. So now I'm going towards 2. Does the limit exist? Am I driving to the same place from the left and the right? And the answer here is yes. I am approaching 1. My y value is 1. Now, is there anything when I get there? No, there's a hole in the graph right there, but that doesn't matter. It's what am I approaching? It's not what's there when I get there. Now, if I do x approaches 3, 3 would be this vertical asymptote right here. Since I have a vertical asymptote, I would e either be approaching negative infinity or infinity. And so as I approach 3 from both sides, I'm going to approach negative infinity. Now, we really do say that this limit doesn't exist, except for we want to know what is the graph doing. So then we do call it negative infinity, since both sides are going to the same place. If one was going to negative infinity, one was going to positive infinity, then we say, would say does not exist. And then how about the limit as x approaches 5? Well, if we look at this, am I driving to the same place from the right and the left? And the answer would be no. Here I'm driving towards 2, and then at the bottom here I'm driving towards negative 1. So we would say that this limit does not exist. Now, function values are different. It's actually what is at that x value at that particular time. So if I take f of, x, f of negative 4, that point would be 1. That's my point. Oh, the limit does equal this value here. Oh, that's cool, okay. F of negative 1, well, the F of negative 1 would be this point right here, which is 1. Does the limit equal this point? No, these two are two different things. So we'll talk about continuity in that in a little bit. Then F of 2 does not exist. There is nothing there. F of 3 does not exist because it's a vertical asymptote. And then F of 5, it does exist. It's that point right there, which would be 2. And so we say that is 2. Now, one-sided limits, this right here, if I say the limit as x approaches c, and I put that right there, of f of x, that means that this is a left-handed limit or a left-sided limit. Okay? And then if I put the limit as x approaches c from the right, that would be a right-handed limit. Okay, so this right here, the plus after the value or the minus after the value 
just says what's happening from one side. So here, as x approaches 5 from the left, so I'm approaching 5 from the left. That would be this one in blue that I'm doing on the graph. What value am I approaching from the left? That would be my negative 1. What value am I approaching now from the right for this other example? Well, what do I approach? That would be a value of 2. Now the question is, are these equal? They are not equal, so the limit as f, x approaches 5 does not exist. If the left-handed limit does not equal the right-handed limit, then the limit does not exist. And so that's what happens there. And I can just take this, and this can just go away now. And we'll go to the next slide. All right, continuity. Continuity, what we want to do with this is a function. Well, a function is continuous. Where you can draw it without lifting a pencil. Now, that is the intuitive idea. We'll get into something more formal later. But roughly continuous means that everything's connected. Formally, a function is continuous where its limit and function values are the same. In this course, we'll work with three different types of discontinuity. So we have holes. And many of you dealt with this in pre-calculus. Vertical asymptotes and jumps. There's a fourth type that is an oscillating discontinuity. This one's kind of fun to search. And then you got to zoom in. So graph that and zoom in, and you can see what happens with that one. That would be a different type of discontinuity that we don't deal with too often. So the points that we looked at before, well, I'm getting down to this example here. i got to read this. Example 21, list the x-coordinates of the discontinuities of this function that we graphed here. Now, when we look at this, what happens is that we look for these holes, these vertical asymptotes, and these jumps. And so the first point that we looked at before was this negative 4. Now, if you look at this, my limit exists. I'm driving from the left, driving from the right to the same place. And what's there when I get there? Well, that point is the same thing as the limit. So therefore, at x equal to negative 4, we are continuous. So I would not list that down here at example 21. Now, if we look at here, x equal to negative 1, I'm definitely going to list that we have a hole. Now, it doesn't matter that we have put this point here or not, but we do have a hole, so that would be a discontinuity. Then the next one would be at x equal to 2, another hole. And then how about x equal to vertical asymptote? Are we undefined? Yes. And so we're going to have a jump there. Um, not a jump, but point of discontinuity, x equal to 3. And then my other one is x equal to Five. This one right here is called a jump, because really I, that's what I do. I got to go from this point right here. I shouldn't fill that in. From this point right here, and I jump to get over to here. So the right-handed limit does not equal the left-handed limit, and they're two different numbers. So those would be my points of discontinuities. Now. Discontinuities, all these discontinuities can be classified as removable or non-removable. This isn't a huge deal, but it seems maybe a little bit foreign. But a removable discontinuity, anytime you have a hole, that's when you'd have a removable discontinuity. So on my graph up here, I'm going to have a removable discontinuity there. This one's a little weird with this other point defined, but that one should be a removable discontinuity as well. Then the other types of discontinuities would be a non-removable discontinuity. So that's your jump, vertical asymptotes, or your oscillations. So up on my graph here again, here's a jump. Here's a vertical asymptote. Those would be the non-removable discontinuities. Now, example 22 says, which of the discontinuities are removable? That would be my whole, so it would be x equal to negative 1, and then I also have x equal to 2. Those would be removable. 
Therefore, the other two, x equal to 3, x equal to 5, would both be non-removable. When we talk about limits and continuity, we're going to be able to look at different forms to find out if we do have limits or not. One form that you will see are graphs. Whenever you see a graph, you should be able to look at it and see it at, if at a particular x-coordinate that you do have a limit that does exist. And so you're going to have to look at it with graphs. The other way that you're going to have to look at it is through taking and looking at an equation and the limit as it sets up. And so in these examples right here, we're going to give you, we're going to give you functions. Okay, so we have graphs and we have functions. The third type is that we're going to give you a table of values, and we'll get to that later. So now, if I see this right here, this means that as x approaches 3, well, this is just a polynomial. It's a quadratic. Well, if it's continuous, which a quadratic is, all I have to do is plug this 3 in, and I should be able to find this value. So if I plug that 3 in with a direct substitution, which is what we say right here, all I get is 27 plus 2, I get 29, direct substitution. Try these and see if you can do a direct substitution on those and find those values. Check my work, see if I did this right, but I get 1 when I do a direct substitution there. And for the cosine of 2 pi over 3, just take this pi over 3 and plug it in to the x. So I get 2 pi over 3 over here. And then the cosine of 2 pi over 3 is equal to the negative 1 half. So with functions, your first choice would be direct substitution. Can't spell it. There we go. Direct substitution. Now, we will get to indeterminate forms here in a little bit, but direct substitution works as long as you don't have one of those points of discontinuity. Next page, piecewise functions. We want to look at piecewise functions and one-sided limit might be necessary. And so that's what we wrote over here. This, remember, is your left-handed limit. This right here would be your right-handed limit. I need these two to be equal in order for the overall limit to exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a direct substitution in there with this point of concern. That's my split-up point over this piecewise function. So 4 minus 1 would just be a 3. That would be my left-sided limit because we're less than 1. Right-sided limit would be x greater than 1. So I'm going to take this 1 and plug it into there and there. So I get 4 minus 1 again, which would also be 3. So what does that say about my overall limit? Since these two are the same, I can say that my overall limit is also that number. Now look at g of x. You try the same thing with g of x and come to a conclusion. So if you plugged into g, the left-sided limit, where we are before 1, is going to be 2. And then after 1, it's going to be 1. So they're not the same. We're not driving in the same place. This would be a jump discontinuity. So I'm going to write dne does not exist. Now, they say for this same g function, x approaches negative 1 of g of x. What is my limit? And so if I go up here, which piece am I going to plug into, 1 or 2? I hope that you can see that it would be 1 because negative 1 is less than 1. And so I'm going to do a direct substitution on this negative 1. And people sometimes struggle with this negative 1 being raised to a power and these minuses and everything. So keep everything in order. But I'm going to get negative 3. And then negative 1 to the third would be negative 1. And so I'm going to get overall minus minus, which would be a plus. So I'm going to end up with negative 2. So that would just be a direct substitution because negative 1 is not my point of concern with this split up here. I can just plug it into whichever piece it falls into, which turns out to be the first piece. Moving on, the greatest integer function. With the greatest integer function, what we have is f of x is equal to, and then they put these fancy bars here. You should have been exposed to this somewhere along the line, but possibly not. 
Another way to call this is the round down function. And if you do computer programming or anything, they also call it the int function. So it's the integer part of what you're doing. However, when we get to negative values, it gets a little quirky. So what happens is that if this is the round down function, what happens is that I take x approaches 1 half. And if we round that down, we're going to get 0. And on my graph right here, x equal to 1 half is right here. And you notice that I am on my 0 line. So that's why that thing is graphed. And when I get up to this point right here, that would be a value, x value of 1. If I round down 1, I'm going to get to 1. So that's why it jumps up like this. So we have many jumps on the integer function, greatest integer function. So if I do this 1, I just explained what that is, that would give me that 1. Now if I plug in a one-sided limit, this is x approaches 5 from the left. So now you should be thinking... What's a number that's slightly to the left of 5? I like to think of 4.9. If I would plug 4.9 into here, that would give me a 9.8 minus 3. Oh, I can't put that as equals, though. Stop for a second. Well, I can't put it as equal because all I'm doing is thinking this. So I think this in my head. So this would be a 9.8 minus 3. If I do that, it's 6.8. If I round that down, what is that actually? So what happens is that when I round this down, this would round down to a 6. And so you got to think left-handed limit just below whatever number you're dealing with. If I thought it 5 exactly, well, then this would be a 7. But I'm below that, so it's going to round down to 6. So this one concludes dealing with limits and continuity, and we have the grace integer function that we finished up here with, which is actually a real-life function that gets used quite a bit. Think of your phone bill. And what happens then is that uh, we've looked at limits with both graphs and functions, and we want to also know if functions are continuous at specific values, and so that's where we're at so far. We'll keep on with continuity and other things going on, and move into calculus soon enough. Have a great day.